Good afternoon. My name is Marcia Garrett. I'm the president of the World Affairs Council of Tacoma, and we're so pleased to welcome you to this afternoon's conversation with Congresswoman Marilyn Strickland. For those of you who are new to the council, we have been active in the South Sound for decades with the mission to create globally minded citizens. We do this in various ways, largely through events like this afternoon's. We've got several cool programs coming up in the next couple months, so I hope you'll noodle on our website and see if one might speak to you. We've got one coming up on climate change, one on our trade policy with China, a monthly travel and adventure book club, and then a foreign policy discussion group on Turkey and Cyprus. So visit the website and do think about becoming a member of the council or supporting our work. We would appreciate both. I'd like to give a special thanks to today's terrific co-sponsors who've helped us in promoting this event. They include the Tacoma Sister Cities Association, the World Trade Center of Tacoma, and the Asia Pacific Cultural Center. We really appreciate their help and hope you'll join them at one of their upcoming events soon. So with that, let me give you a brief introduction of today's speaker. Congresswoman Strickland was born in Seoul, South Korea. Her dad was a World War II and Korean War vet who met her mom while posted in Korea. When they moved to the States, he was stationed at then Fort Lewis Army Base and the family lived on base. So who would have thought that lo those many years later, she'd be representing JBLM in Congress. You've just gotta love that. Congressman Strickland received her BA from the University of Washington, Seattle and an MBA from Clark Atlanta University a former two-term mayor of Tacoma and CEO of the Greater Seattle Chamber of Commerce, she has a couple of important firsts attached to her name. She's the first African-American to represent Washington in the Congress and one of only three Korean Americans to sit in the US Congress ever in its 231 year history. So for the Tacomans who are joining us today, here's an important thing to remember about the Congresswoman's district. Tacoma is a piece of it, but it's a really little piece. Its heart is in Olympia, and it includes portions of Pierce, Thurston, and Mason counties. So we still call her one of our own, but her district has moved south. She's been a friend of the councils for years, and we're so pleased to welcome her today. So with that, I'd like to welcome Congresswoman Marilyn Strickland. Thank you for having me here, Marcia, and thank you to the World Affairs Council and the other sponsors for hosting me. I look forward to today's discussion. Well, great. We've got a boatload of questions, so why don't we just go ahead and jump right in. And I'd like to start at the beginning and dial our conversation back to November. In the first week of November, you were elected to Congress. In the first week of January, you were sworn in. In those two short months, which includes a Thanksgiving and a Christmas holiday, you closed a campaign, you staffed a DC office and two district offices, you found a new place to live, and it was all during a global pandemic. That, that strikes me as a really big lift, and I'm wondering if you can tell us about that. Great. Well, thanks for the question. And the way you described it is far more tidy and orderly than it actually was, <laughs> but we got it done. And so, yes, you're right. So, you know, I won the election in November and not long after that, before Thanksgiving, we had freshman orientation in Washington, D.C. So all the freshmen were flown to D.C. and we were put up in a hotel. Remember, this was in the major throes of the pandemic. So we all had to take COVID tests. We had to wear masks and we had to socially distance as we were learning about how you pick an office, how you pick a staff, just some of the rules and regulations that come with being a member of Congress. And after that, we returned again in December for more orientation. But I do remember, you know, my predecessor, Denny Heck, who was the first person to hold the seat, said to me, it's going to be very overwhelming. You're gonna have a lot of things to do, but focus on three things that will make your life easier. Find a place to live, start lobbying for the committee assignments that you want and start to think about hiring your chief of staff and your district director. You have to get those three things done before, you know, to have some semblance of order. And those things didn't necessarily happen in that order. It took me a while to find a place, 
But here I am right now, and I'm very proud that we were able to hire a good staff, you know, set up a really good infrastructure, both in DC and especially here at home, and really just thinking about, you know, how we're going to effectively serve the 10th district of Washington state. But, you know, during a pandemic, it's a little strange. And here's what I tell people, you know, I've met these new people that I serve with. I've met my freshman class but we're always wearing masks when we see each other. And so I've really not seen people in person from head to toe because we typically meet over Zoom if we're not masked. And so, yes, I'm getting to know people, but at the same time, I still really haven't seen them with their full faces. It'll be so nice when you get to see everybody's chops and what they look like unadorned. That's right. That's right. Um, so you were sworn in on January 3rd, and then just three days later, we had the events of January 6th when the US Capitol was overrun in a major affront to our democracy. Yeah. What, where were you on that day and how did you stay safe? So as I think about the events of January, Marcia, I call it three Wednesdays in January. And as you were right, it started on that Sunday the 3rd, which was our swearing in, which is a very exciting occasion, especially for the freshmen in the throes of a pandemic. And I wore hanbok on the house floor, which is a traditional Korean dress that women wear for special occasions. And I thought that was important to send a message about my cultural heritage, to show and honor respect for my mother who couldn't be there and also send a message that the US House of Representatives is the people's house and belongs to all people, regardless of where you were born, what language you speak at home, or even if you have parents who speak with an accent, that was very important to me. But three days later, there was the failed coup attempt and the insurrection to try and overturn the results of a legitimate election. And you know, on that day, we were supposed to go through a very cursory exercise of going state by state to cert certify each election and then vote all together to basically certify Joe Biden as president and Kamala Harris as vice president. We knew that there would be a handful of states that would object to that. And when we got to Arizona, you know, I was in my office. I was not in the chambers to vote yet because there was going to be a floor debate about this. And you're watching on television and you see what unfolded. You saw the door suddenly close. People started shuffling around. People were moving around quickly and you knew something was wrong. So I was a block away from the Capitol building, not inside the building when all that mayhem took place. So I was lucky, but you know, you're there on the Capitol campus and everything's going on lockdown. We're told to stay away from the windows, to stay sheltered in place. And then as you know, they moved some members of Congress into actually into my building, into Longworth for people to stay safe and to have safe harbor. And so it was just a very um, disorienting, frightening, for, disorienting and frightening time. And of course, you know, people were killed sadly. And again, people were trying to delegitimize legitimate election. The only bright spot of that day was that we stayed until three o'clock in the morning, Marcia, and we certified the election. So we did our job. And the subsequent Wednesday, we filed article of impeachment and then the Wednesday after that, there was the peaceful transfer of power and the swearing in of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. But it was tense when we were there. What a wild month. Really? What a, oh, my God. Wow. Wild ride. Yeah. Wild ride. Many of today's guests had um, similar questions and concerns, and that revolved around the alarming rise in violence and hate crimes against Asian American and Pacific Islander communities, and in particular women. Mm -hmm. the, I know the killings in Atlanta were closely covered in Korean language media, both here and abroad. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to this? I, I know you did at the APCC rally this past weekend, but this is such a it's such an alarming trend. I'd love your thoughts on this. Well, I mean, first I wanna take a big step back to the history of violence in this country, sadly. And we can go back to the slaves who were brought here from Africa, to the genocide of Native Americans, to the expulsion of Chinese, like we saw in Tacoma through the quote Tacoma method, the internment of Japanese American citizens, the fight for civil rights for African Americans, the way that people coming from the South, you know, from our Southern borders, border countries, Mexico, Central America, how they've been treated. And then now here we are in 2021 addressing anti-Asian violence. And, you know, this violence spiked starting in 2020 with COVID. And I don't think it's a coincidence that some of the hateful rhetoric coming out of the former administration and their enablers 
using terms like, you know, Kung flu have really fomented that type of behavior. You know, since 2020, the number of hate crimes against Asian Americans has risen by 150%. And we know that those numbers are underreported. And then you just see it happening, you know, more and more, and you hear these horrible stories. And then, of course, on that tragic Tuesday in Atlanta, you saw a shooter go from spa to spa targeting Asian women, and sadly, you know, six of them lost their lives. And so as we think about what this means in the United States, there's been the big movement of Stop Asian Hate, but people have been talking about this crying for help since last year. So it is my hope that as we think about how we move forward as a nation, that people are comfortable speaking out when they're victims of hate crime, that people are held accountable when crime is committed. But I think more importantly, that we all stand up together as allies and say, we need to stop this violence. And, and again, I remind us that violence against minorities is not a new thing in this country, but here's an opportunity for all of us to stand together like we did in Tacoma last weekend at the Chinese Reconciliation Park, united saying, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. But you're right that words matter and the tenor that's being set by the present administration is light years removed. And I know the administration has passed is, is advocating some legislation that gets at this as well. Yeah. I hope he can set a new tone for the country. Indeed, and I do believe that President Biden has a very thoughtful and inclusive philosophy. He understands the value that immigrants bring to this community, to our country and this nation and what we do. And you know, he's even talked about the violence himself and we're trying to pass some legislation out of Congress to form a commission on hate crimes using the power of the Department of Justice to investigate. And there's even a bill called the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act that my colleague Grace Meng has introduced. So again, we want it to stop more than anything else. But if people commit this crime, we want folks to feel comfortable and empowered to report it. And we want people to be held accountable when these crimes are committed. Thank you for that. Um, several questions emerged out of your committee assignments. Um, and you, you, you did something right because you got two great committees. Um, you, you mentioned advocating in that first week for the committees that you want, but these, these are sweetheart committees, transportation and infrastructure and armed services. So there were a few questions that were related and intertwined, and so I'll put them all forward. Um, how do you hope to benefit your district by virtue of being on these committees? If a major infrastructure package does move forward, what are some specific priorities you've identified for the 10th? And one of our guests wants to know if there's any chance light rail from Tacoma to SeaTac might be in the mix. It's going to be a long wait for Sound Transit. And Give us a little ray of hope here, Congresswoman. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there are about five questions embedded in all of that. But let me just start with saying, you know, when you when you're in when you go to Congress and you pick your committee assignments, you know, you every time there's a new Congress, you submit your priorities for what you want to do, and that's how the committee assignments happen. And you know, being a freshman, you are very honest about what's likely to happen. But I actually, you know, I, I lucked out. We made a very strong case for two, you know, authorizing committees, and so I chose those committees specifically because they meet the needs of the 10th district. And the work you do in Congress isn't restricted to just the committees you sit on, but you have a chance to have a lot of influence. So on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, you know, I am working on the Puget Sound Recovery Act, which actually came out of the markup. And so it was voted to get passed on to the House floor. And this is something that Derek Kilmer and I co-chairing to basically make sure that the Puget Sound is cleaned up, especially with all the population growth that we're having up and down the I-5 corridor. It is to elevate the Puget Sound so it has the same status as Chesapeake Bay and the Great Lakes. It allocates $50 million a year for five years to work on cleanup. And it establishes an office at the EPA that is really focused on the Puget Sound. So I think that's really great. The other thing for transportation and infrastructure, you know, we're going to work hard to try and finish some of the interchanges around JBLM, Joint Base lewis mccord We're going to obviously want to invest in mass transit and working really hard to make sure that Sound Transit gets some more funding as we move forward. But as you know, there are just, the list of projects for transportation are very long and we never have, excuse me, I'm gonna sneeze here. Excuse me. And we never have sufficient resources to fully fund everything we want, but a lot of needs in the 10th district. But I just thought that this committee was so important because of my background in transportation and infrastructure, but because it meets the needs of our district. And then let's go to House Armed Services. 
So on the Armed Services Committee, I serve on the Military Personnel Committee and the Readiness Committee. And this is really focused on the men and women who serve to make sure that they're getting the resources that they need, that they have housing on post that's not substandard, that their families are being taken care of, and very important issues. Because I remind folks that when we think about the military, we typically often think of the, the machines, the hardware, but it's men and women who choose to serve. And in the military, 40% of the people who serve are people of color, and 20% are African American. I'm the only African American woman who serves on the House Armed Services Committee. And I just thought it was important for me to have the voice for Joint Base Lewis McCord, the largest military installation on the West Coast, which has an $8 billion a year annual impact and is the second largest employer in the state to make sure that our voice was heard and that the needs were met. And so I'm very honored to serve on both of those committees that are authorizing committees and can have a huge impact on the 10th district and the state, to be honest with you. Are you gonna get us that light rail to the airport? Well, you know, the light rail, <laughs> the light rail to the airport is on its way. As you know, it takes a long time to build things in the United States, but you know, it's, it's to federal way and if it's a federal way, it will be coming to Tacoma soon. But I know that the COVID, you know, the, the impact of COVID on the economy has battered some of Sound Transit's funding. But I know that Senator Murray is working on getting funding. And every chance I get, I'm trying to make sure that we are investing in light rail so that the South Sound has access to those great services that make this region strong. We want you to be Secretary Buttigieg's best friend. <laughs> well, I did testify because he came to our committee. And so um, I had a chance to testify and talk about light rail, um, transit-oriented development, high-speed rail. And so I had a chance to get in front of him. Oh, great. Great. Okay. Um, many people decry the hyper-partisan state of national politics, much of which, again, was brought into stark relief with the events of January 6th. How do you anticipate working effectively across the aisle in such a singularly polarized Congress? Give yeah, us a way up here. No, this is a really good question because if you think about the media coverage of politics and how things are presented, you know, there definitely is value in clicks and people paying attention when you have stark contrasts. And I will admit that some of the people in my freshman class that I served with really have no business being in Congress. They are not there to deliver for the people. For them, it's a bit of a circus and a sideshow. With that said though, I, know I serve on two committees, transportation and infrastructure and house armed services. And those two committees have a history of bipartisan cooperation. And so I think that gives me hope that I can work in a bipartisan manner. Um, you know, I recently introduced a bill to provide a congressional medal to Young Oak Kim, who was a general in the US Army and he's Korean American, he's passed away. And I introduced it in a bar bipartisan way with my fellow Democrat, Andy Kim, who's Korean American and with Young Kim and Michelle Steele who are two Korean American women who are Republicans. And the four of us introduced this bill together. So it is possible to have bipartisan support on some things. The other thing I wanna point out too though, you know, the recent American Rescue Plan that was passed, it didn't have bipartisan support on Capitol Hill and the halls of Congress, but it had strong bipartisan support with the general public. And so as I think about the definition of bipartisan, I wanna make sure it's not just about the halls of Congress, but really reminding folks that as people, as Americans, we can often come together when we need to. And the fact that the American Rescue Plan was supported by business, by labor, by people of all political affiliations demonstrates that it's possible if the will is there. I think we lose sight of that too easily. We focus on the Congress and the dysfunction when in fact there's so much commonality in the country at large on some of these issues. Absolutely. We've got to cling to some of these things for hope. Um, harkening back to your comments about armed services, I know that when the First Lady was at Joint Base Lewis McCord recently, you met with Dr. Biden and she was there as part of her tour that focused on quality of life for service members and their children. Um, I know that's an issue of interest to you. Can you build a little bit more on that? It's, it's hard to be focused on your mission if you're worried about the possibility of black mold in the bathroom at home or whether you have enough money to cover all the bills. Absolutely. So readiness depends so much on family stability for people in the military who have families. 
And when Dr. Biden came to Joint Base Lewis McCord, it was um, it was great for a couple of reasons. Number one, this was the first military base that she has visited since her term as First Lady, and I think this may have been her first official visit anywhere. And you know, when you meet Dr. Biden, you just know how authentic and kind she is. And you just think to yourself that, you know, she and President Biden have been on this journey for a long time. And we were talking about patience. And I remember she said, oh, yes, I know what patience is. And, you know, that was kind of a, a, a you know, kind of a nod to how hard they've worked to get here to the White House. With that said, you know, we met at the Children's Museum at JBLM, which is modeled after the Children's Museum of Tacoma. And, you know, Tanya was there who runs the Children's Museum of Tacoma, and it was a strong partnership to have this museum on base at JBLM. And it's the only military base in the US that has a children's museum. And this museum is there not just for the activity and the play of the children, but it's a place for the parents to hang out. It's like a community gathering space for parents. And so if you look around Joint Base Lewis McCord, I think, I don't know if people know this or not, but it is one of the most requested posts in the military. So people want to come here to be stationed because of the quality of life in the Northwest. And a lot of people who end up here at JBLM, when they get out of the service, they stay here. here. Historically, people have gone back to their original home states, but people like this region so much that they want to stay here. And so it's really important to make sure the quality of life is good for the people who are serving, for their families, and also for the retirees who are veterans. The impact of Fort Lewis on this state's economy, it is staggering. It is staggering. It, the whole I-5 corridor is kept not afloat, but is, is made so much more robust by the presence of that base. Really Are, have there been any conversations about a base realignment commission in the near term? I have not heard anything about BRAC. And so um, it's, it's not come up in conversation. And so, you know, right now, I think the focus for us as a nation is just getting through this pandemic, getting vaccines in arms, getting students back to school, getting cash in people's hands through unemployment, through the rescue checks, all the things we want to do, and then get, putting people back to work. So I've not heard any conversation about BRAC, Marsha. Well, that's reassuring. Yeah. Um, this is kind of a weird question, but are you having fun? Um, this is, is what your experience in Congress remotely like what you had expected or anticipated? I know it's only been 100 days, but you're recounting that first month. What a wild ride this has been. Are, do, you, do you like what you're doing? You know, oddly enough, despite the backdrop of a pandemic, a failed coup attempt, and what feels like a place where I haven't really met people the way you would normally meet people as a freshman, I am enjoying it. And I'm enjoying it for a few reasons. You know, we haven't, the impact that you can make as a member of Congress, I think is sometimes underappreciated. And I know that there's been so much conversation in the last few years about how like, oh, they're ineffective. They don't do anything. The approval ratings are so low. They're dysfunctional. And there is absolutely some truth to that. But we just passed the American Rescue Plan. And to address the pandemic, we had to do something this bold, but there are things in that plan that are going to endure beyond the pandemic. You know, the, you know, the, the, the tax credit that you get for having children. I mean, there's going to be an opportunity to reduce child poverty in a major way. We're doing some things that in many ways can extend beyond the pandemic and the relief that we're doing. I was so proud, for example, that you know, as part of this package that we passed, that we were able to recognize that local governments and local cities have been battered by this. And so we've provided $360 billion of release to local and state government so that they can spend the money to do the things that they know they need to do to support their communities. And so there's a lot in this package to like. So in many ways, I feel very productive. The House has passed the, um, the American Dreamer Act, which helped dreamers find a path to citizenship. We passed the Farm Worker Modernization Act to help farm workers find a path to citizenship. You know, we passed the PRO Act, which protects the right for people to organize and form unions. You know, we've passed the Violence Against Women Act. We reauthorized it. So we've done some things great in the House. But as we know, we need the Senate to do their job and pass things. We passed common sense gun reform in the House, universal background checks, closing the Charleston loophole. We need the Senate to take action. And so I think the challenge for us in the Capitol is the House can do great things with a Democratic majority, and even though it's a slim one, but what's the Senate gonna do? Are we gonna carry these things forward because the American people wanna see progress? 
Not to mention the work that the House did on the voting rights and HR1 yeah. and the roadblock it's run into in the Senate. Yeah. Um, the House is kind of busting its chops, but hopefully the Senate will take your lead. Can you speak at all to the um, to the delegation? More than once, I've thought how lucky, how fortunate Washington is to be represented by so many really smart, able people in both parties. That must be a joy for you. Yeah, you know, I will tell you that, you know, I've not spent a ton of time on the Hill around other delegations, but Washington State has what I believe is the strongest delegation in the country. We are, we have smart, thoughtful people who are good at their jobs. We don't always agree 100% with everything that we do, but I do believe that people go there to do the work and to do it well. And I think about, you know, our two senators. I think about the delegation that, you know, that is represented from people with different backgrounds and different life experiences, but also the committees we sit on and how, you know, we're in positions of leadership. And, you know, if you think about the work that Washington State is doing, you know, we can do very well in the 117th Congress. And even the fact that, you know, on some you know, occasions, we do have bipartisan support within our own caucus. We know that two of our caucus members voted for impeachment because it was the right thing to do. We've had cooperation with the Farm Modernization Act because we know agriculture is a big deal in Eastern Washington. And I remind folks that, you know, there's this tradition that the Washington State delegation has where there is a painting of a baby chick and it's called the chick pick and it gets handed down to the freshman who joins the delegation and so I'm the recipient and the keeper of the chick pick right now and it was a chance for the whole delegation to get together in a bipartisan way and have this ceremony and so like I said we don't always agree on everything even within the democratic caucus sometimes but it's an honor to serve with the delegation because I do believe Washington state has a very strong solid powerful delegation very strong, powerful women with a boatload of seniority. That's right. That will serve us well. Yeah. Now, this is kind of a curious question, but I know of your particular interest in Korea. So do you see a reunification of the Korean Peninsula in our lifetimes? Well, I don't know, Marsha, if I could say in our lifetimes, but as you know, I have a very personal interest in South Korea. I have an interest from the perspective of being, you know, a leader in Washington state that is a very trade dependent state. In Washington state, that's a very tourism oriented state. And then of course, the work that I did as mayor was Sister Cities International, our strong relationship with Korea. And so, you know, I realistically don't see necessarily a quote reunification of the peninsula becoming one country like it was before it was divided, but there's some bright lights I see. I don't know if you know this or not, but, you know, there's a big movement to reunite families that got separated when the country was divided in two. And so you see families being reunited where people say, well, I have a relative in North Korea and they are able literally to be reunited. There were about 140,000 total people on the list saying they wanted to get reunited with relatives in North Korea. That number is down to 60,000 because people have gotten old and died. And so family reunification is a really important part for me when I think about some of the things we can do regarding you know, reunification. I think about you know, trying to denuclearize, but that is a very hard political decision to have to discuss and what that means. And then finally, you know, we've never formally declared an end to the Korean War. And so if there was a formal declaration that ended the war, what exactly does that mean? But I think a few things need to happen. I'm a big supporter of the reuniting families right now, especially because that population is aging. And I also believe that if we're gonna have good diplomacy and public policy between the US and North Korea, between the two Koreas, you need more women at the table. You just need more women at the table in roles of leadership. And I don't say that because we're just going to roll over or because I, I just think there's a different conversation to be had when you have women at the table talking about things that are really important to all of us. Has the North been receptive to efforts at family reunification? They have been. And I do believe that the last administration decided to not do that anymore. And don't quote me on this. I could be wrong about it. But I do believe that there's interest in Congress right now to try to start that up again and have those reunifications. And, you know, and I go back to my experience with sister cities. You know, governments have their issues, their geopolitical, national security, global security issues. And of course, I support those as, you know, a member of the Armed Services Committee and what I want to do. But I also understand that so much of it is one-on-one, -on -one, people to people relationships, developing an understanding, people getting to know each other. And in this case, families being reunited with each other. 
You know, when you were mayor of Tacoma, you did so much to help position the city and the region as a global region. And um, we're successful in bringing in EB-5 money and helping people to think about this area as a very important global nexus. Will your position on armed services help you with that? Is that, a, is that a, an effort you want to continue to pursue? Yeah, I mean, I would say regardless of my committee assignment, that is something that is just interesting to me personally and because I love this state and I love this region. And so, you know, I think sometimes when people are in elected office and we talk about international things or we talk about things across an ocean or we use the word global, it scares people. And for some people, when you use those words, the first thing that comes to mind is, oh, those foreigners taking away my jobs in another country. And those of us who understand international relations have to do a better job of explaining how good trade deals benefit workers here at home. They create more jobs. Having strong ties with companies and, and countries across the ocean, those things are good for us here at home. And so we have to do a better job of explaining the truth of how we benefit from those relationships and why they're good for the country. And again, coming back to Joe Biden, you know, he is a president is very, very keen on diplomacy and restoring our leadership position in the world because it is eroded dramatically and we have an opportunity to get it back. And that's good for trade. It's good for student exchange. It's good for economies. And it, to be honest with you, it's good for global security. Right. Just as an aside, we're so pleased today that um, Catalan Pierman, who is the um, head of the Consular Association reception, um, Consular Association is here, as are many of her fellow consuls who were eager to hear from you. So that was, um, that was a nice plus. We're reminded of what a global world this is when one ship in the Suez Canal can bring global shipping to a halt for a week. Yeah. That was exciting. It was. it was. It was exciting and dramatic. And I think it just really gave everyone a very stark reminder of how interconnected the global economy is because things came and you saw those pictures of those ships just sitting in the harbor waiting. You know, I think another thing that's important to talk about too, as we talk about international relationships is understanding that climate change. I mean, from a foreign policy standpoint, climate change is one of our top priorities because we talk about the things that we want to do here domestically. And that's everything from, you know, reimagining our power grid to adding more electrical vehicle charging stations, to investing more in mass transit, to exploring you know, other forms of energy that we know are going to be cleaner, but also understanding that this is an international phenomenon. And I know that President Biden has rejoined the Paris Climate Accord, which is great, but we need to have partnerships around the world with some of these larger countries that are polluting a lot and think about what our overall international strategy is going to be to address climate change. This is a issue of, you know, obviously public health. It's an issue of national security. It's an issue of food security. I mean, you see people fleeing parts of the world because it's too hot and they have no food. And so as we think about climate change, it has ramifications across the board. And the Secretary of Defense, Senator, Senator Secretary Lloyd Austin, who's the first African-American DOD head, he has declared climate change a national security issue and the Department of Defense is making it a priority. Um, Adam Smith, as chair of armed services, has yeah. made that point many, many times. Uh, the importance of climate change is a national security issue. When you're dealing with climate refugees and the instability that that causes globally, yeah. I'm so glad that Secretary of Austin is on it because it's a huge charge. It is. You know, we have so many more questions that are on our list today, but I'm also mindful of the fact that you have another engagement and... Um, other obligations. So I would like to know if do you have any closing car, um, closing comments you'd like to share with us today? I do. We well, sign off? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you to the World Affairs Council and to everyone who is tuning in. I appreciate it. And I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. But you know, I will say this, you know, as I think about the 117th Congress that I'm privileged to be part of, it is the most diverse Congress in its history, more women and more people of color who are serving. And as we come through this pandemic, and we will, you know, focusing on the American Rescue Plan, again, vaccines in arms, cash in people's hands, getting kids back to school, and putting people back to work. And more than anything, we need to restore trust in government. 
People need to see in firsthand experience that government, when it works well, can benefit the people. And that's part of the reason we have been so assertive with the American Rescue Plan. We are working on an infrastructure plan and there will be two parts. It will be what I call traditional infrastructure, you know, maintaining and rebuilding roads and bridges and transit. And then there's going to be what I'm going to call the social safety net infrastructure, looking at the caregiving infrastructure for both children and elders, looking at some of the programs we have to keep people's basic needs met, affordable housing. And so as I look at the 117th Congress, I am optimistic. We will need the Senate to do its part. And that's where the conversation about filibuster comes up. Voting rights are on the line, which means democracy is on the line. But at the same time, you know, it's an exciting time. It is a tumultuous time. And I am just honored to be part of the 117th Congress and to have the privilege of representing Washington State in my district, the 10th. Well, we're so glad you're there. And we're so glad that you honored us today with your time. So I thank you again. And please know you have a standing invitation. If you ever want a forum to talk about any kind of issue, we stand ready. Um, I'd like to thank again our wonderful co-sponsors, the Asia Pacific Cultural Center, the World Trade Center of Tacoma, and the Sister Cities Association of Tacoma. And a very special thanks to you, Congresswoman, for joining us. We really hope to see you again. Thank Great. you. Thank you so much. Hmm.